Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. As we conclude our conversation with Lynn Whitesides, the original member of the September 6, we'll talk about her family's reaction. It wasn't positive. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, her current spirituality, and we'll look back on the September 6 and why she was disfellowshipped and other people were excommunicated, such as Margaret Toscano and Janice Allred. What's the difference there? So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Well, and that's what I want to get into a little bit because it sounds very interesting to me. So you, so a few years later, it sounds like you sent a letter where you were forgiving, or you were kind of asking for forgiveness because of your own anger, but you had no intention really of... Oh, I wasn't coming back. Coming back. I never said I was coming back. That wasn't the point of that letter. Okay. The point of that letter was, I see that I was I was asking you to hear me, and you couldn't because it's hard to hear someone who's really pissed about the way things are. Okay. Right? And one... Not that it's a problem to be pissed, but I was pretty pissed. I was saying things like, I, I could do sound bites, and that was part of the problem. <laughs> um, it, like I was doing talk shows and that kind of stuff. But the other thing is, I really wanted to say, uh, you can't give me what I already have, and that is my own authority, my own power as a, as a human being, as a woman, and I was somehow asking you for that. So I began to realize that I was, because I wanted their approval, I was just dancing around the... The, the patriarchy instead of like going to do something that I really wanted to do. And so when I realized that sent them that letter and then I moved into the direction, I was already in the direction of going in the, in that direction where I am okay. now um, because of things that had shown up in my life and the work that I do that has a lot to do with going to Peru and you know, some of those stuff that I talked about in my talk at Sunstone. Um, but I had, I, no, I was never, I never even had a moment of thinking of coming back when that happened. Okay, so was this kind of a, for lack of a better word, a way to get forgiveness with the church? I just wanted... Where you were forgiving the church? Yeah, yeah. So this was yeah. your own personal forgiveness? Absolutely. The only reason to do forgiveness is for yourself, really, right? To let yourself off the hook. And I, I, I also... I really wanted to let all that go. Like I, I have come to this conclusion: the church is doing exactly what it needs to do, well, whatever that is. For me, it was the perfect amount of patriarchal authority that I needed to find myself and to go. Okay, I don't believe that. That is not good for the world. Patriarchy, in my opinion, is what is crushing the world at this point, and so I don't want that. I want something else. And and so that's that sent me on my way. And without the church, I don't think I would have become who I am, really. So do you regret being baptized or was that nope. just part I don't of your re- journey? Nope. I have I actually think every single step was exactly what I needed. Okay. And so as you're looking at this, um, so you basically kind of forgave the church. And then said, I, I'm moving in this other direction. Uh, can you talk about your spirituality now? Because it sounds like you've just got a different kind of spirituality. Yeah. Let me also say, as much as I, I mean, I still work on the church. Sometimes I hear stories and I'm just like, ugh. You know, it's just like. like get out of there. Because the people, you know, people will come and talk to me because of my, my. Background. Name, yeah, my background. Being part of the September 6th is got a shadow and a light, you know, so you never know. My own spirituality kind of comes out of um, I, I, working with the medicines I work with. So I go to Peru every year, and I work with ayahuasca down there, which if you are aware of the psychedelics that are coming into the country right now, um, there's a book called How to Change Your Mind. Have you read that, or do you know about know. it? So anyway, I mean, there it's been a really interesting Thing, although I don't like the way the culture is taking in psychedelics right now, but 30 years ago I was introduced to them right right after I I got kicked out of the church, and I started doing ceremonies with people and feeling more connected to the earth and to myself and understanding what it means to be human in a different way than like through Mormonism or Christianity really just a whole different way of feeling connected to what I call the divine. And I am nuts about the creator and 
what that energy is that created the universe and all it contains. And so I've had a lot of experiences working, uh, like especially in Peru, working with uh, medicine people and medicine work to understand what it means to what, what I want, what my connection is and how I, you know, my belief, not even belief, my, my feelings of being completely connected to a loving God that is so nuts about all of us that it just keeps loving and loving and loving. And it doesn't matter if you're Mormon or not Mormon, but your path is going to take you, life will take you somewhere. And, and it's the most interesting, amazing ride that I could have ever imagined. Does that make sense? Am I yeah, making sense? It, it, we, could you characterize it as kind of new age religion? Oh, no. Kind of? no, 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 no. No, they, I work with people who have been working, their, their lineage is thousands of years old. Is it more like Native American Native, South American, more South American. South American. South American. South American. Um, uh, yeah, I, there's, more, there's more than just South America, but let's, uh, I can talk about that because it's out of the country. Um, working, I work with a woman down there that is phenomenal, and she does ceremonies. And so I take groups twice a year uh, to her place. And we stay for two weeks. And what happens when you're there is you have this connection with you, you, you know, stuff about yourself that need, you need to kind of connect to. But also you can see this Garden of Eden that she's created out of a deforested place through just the, the information that gets downloaded when you do this sort of stuff and um, the connection she has to the creator and that we all have, really. I don't know how else to, to say this, but... It is this beautiful experience of knowing that you're loved and that everything, everyone is loved and that everyone's doing the best they know how and being human is very difficult. It's very difficult. Okay. And we have a lot of stuff passed down to us that, I mean, I, I, I talked about this in that talk, but I'm also, we have a lot of limiting beliefs that have been passed down from generation to generation, racism, homophobia, uh, misogyny, all those things have been passed down. And so it's not like you can get angry at the people who passed down. I'm nearly not, but you understand that that has been, all of those are out of fear and that fear has, has kept people from really connecting and that the work that I do with medicine work connects you back into the real, uh, the real person, the real essence of who, who we really are. And that has been the priceless to me. Now you said medicine work, and that sounds like you know we always hear about the medicine man, like yeah. kind of a Native American. Yeah. Are you are you kind of a shaman? Oh no 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 no. But I work with this woman down in Peru. I'm gonna I, this woman in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, she would never call herself a shaman either. She's a, she's a, she's an ayahuasquera, but she holds this place for people to come and heal, and it's the most healing. Not everybody should do it, by the way. This is not like, oh, everyone should go out and do any of ayahuasca or peyote or any of those things. But for people that it, it works for, it is a beautiful experience and helps them to heal from the, the generations that have they come from. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it just sounds very Native American. I know it does. I, I you know, I, I'm not Native American, and I'm not South American, and I'm not, I mean, I've worked with the Huichols out, out of Mexico, and I've worked with some of the Quechua tribes, uh, a guy out of, of Machu Picchu, and the, this woman who has Quechua. But it's, it's, it's not, it's not Native, it's just, it's just, I don't even know how to explain it. It's, Native American is one way, but it's more than that. It's, it's the way to, the way of connecting and and caring for the earth and loving the earth. It's very feminine. Let me just put it that way. It's a very feminine process as opposed to the patriarchal process, which is and not that it, I don't think it should all be feminine or all masculine. By the way, I think there needs to be this marriage of both so that there's a balance uh -huh. between them. But the work with medicine work is a very often a very feminine connecting to. Pachamama to the earth and understanding that. And in fact, you know, it's really interesting. There's a new documentary called um, Living to 100 on Netflix, The Secrets of the Blue Zone, Di the Blue Zones, which basically they found these places in the world where people live to 100 and they've done this documentary on what makes this, these people where lots and lots of people live that long and they thrive. They're not, they're not just surviving. 
And a lot of it is they're connected to the the land. They eat the right kinds of food. They have community. They have dance. They have song. All that stuff that we don't have because we're so separated. We're so, like, COVID really did a thing for us where we are just so isolated. And the isolation is a a damaging thing for people because we need community. And one of the things that has happened for me is finding community and being able to hold space for more and more community. And so I work with communities, really. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about your family? Because you said that uh, after you joined the church, your parents did, and then your extended family did. How did they react to your disfellowship? Not so good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, actually, it was really difficult for me because my parents did not have my back. They they said that, you know, I probably never believed the church in the first place and that they were, they, they, they sided with the church, which was very difficult for me. Um, and, um, and then my father had a near death experience and when he had his near death experience, everything changed. And from the moment that happened, we had a real connection and a real understanding of each other. And he no longer was like all church. He was more all love. And that was an absolutely beautiful thing with my dad and I. Um, but so, yeah, it was really difficult. I, uh, the extended family, I, I'd hardly ever talked to them after that. Um, my brother left the church before I did, um, and um, and my mom is still in the. She's ninety three, but she is still very Mormon and really believes the Mormon Church. Okay. Yeah. So your family has continued to attend. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And so a lot of my do great. Do they view you kind of as a black sheep? Probably. Um, like my uncle, my uncle has passed. My great aunts and uncles all died. They all became Mormons. Um, my father, the, their people are dying off, right? So right. that's part of it. But the, the, some of them are still very active, and I don't. I mean, I, I, I probably am the sort of black sheep of the family, but in in that area. But Do they still invite you to like church events, baptisms, things like that? Um, nobody. So I have some that live here in Utah, and um, I know I don't get invited to those things. It's not. I mean, I don't even feel like they're like not inviting me. They just know I'm not interested. I think that's more than, I don't feel ostracized. Okay. But I also don't have much in common with them. You know, you when, once you leave the church and then you hang out with people who are in the church and they're mainly talking about their church callings and their, you know, all that stuff is just like, oh, okay, but can we talk about the climate? Can we talk about something? You know, so, uh, so I don't feel hurt by that at all, at all by my family doing okay. their thing. You know, that they they went that direction and I'm this direction and they, so But okay they still that. love you and you still love them. Yeah, I don't feel unloved at all. I do felt a little I felt a little disappointed by my parents not having my back. That was mm-hmm. hard. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that was. Yeah. Can you talk about the evolution of Sunstone over <laughs> I guess it's been 30 years. Over 30 years, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess you haven't really I don't know. Lot, I mean, so. I, I, I go when they when they bring us out and say, here, it's been 10 years, now it's been 30 years, so I don't know if we'll ever do it again because we're getting old. But um, <laughs> So I just I just went to that one session, and it was lovely. I was surprised that there were so many people there, actually, that people even remembered was quite surprising to me that the, the September 6th happened. And the people are still interested in that. talking to you on podcast. I know, right. It's not, it was just really surprising to me. But um, yeah, I don't, I can't really speak to the evolution um, since Albert left. Because you've just left I mean, it behind, yeah. basically. I mean, I, I really have gone to, I have this really amazingly wonderful, fun life. And that's kind of where my focus is. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk, since you were the first to get disciplined, uh, can you talk about the dominoes that fell after you and your reaction? Uh, well, you know, we went to, I mean, everybody went to all the courts. It was this very, it was like, so mine comes, this was great. I called Levina, Levina, I got this letter. She's like, this was at night on a Sunday night. She's like, I'll be over tomorrow. She comes over the next day. She's got homemade bread and jam, calls every newspaper and every news thing. I mean, she called everybody. Oh, wow. So that's how the alert went out, right? And, um, and so, but at that point, it was only me. But soon after, I think even before my court, I can't remember, I, I think it was September 14th or something. Um, I can't, I think she might have gone, people were beginning to get letters. So that's why it was like, like and, and Levina, Levina 
liked the sound of the September 6 better than the September 5, so she included Avraham in that. Oh. <laughs> she thought it sounded better. Well, it should have been. I mean, because at, at, I think it was in your session there was another author that said it really should be the September 8 because we should include Janice and But that Margaret. didn't happen for another couple of years. Right. So, well, Janice a year later, and that's the other thing. I wrote a letter. I, let me tell you about Janice. The, the, the Janice getting excommunicated was so strange to me. Oh. Because she was a believing Mormon. She has nine kids. Like the thing is that Janice writes papers that are so intellectual that most people can't even understand them, you know? <laughs> and I wrote a letter to the editor that about her, which was really it was so much fun to write because I wrote about how, you know, she, you know, who she was. She's this believing Mormon. She's got all these kids. And, you know, I said that and I basically said at the end, I said, you know, maybe the general authorities needed to Stop pretending that there was a Victorian era where women stayed home and were happy and men went to work, but embraced their true brothers of the Middle Ages who went on a witch hunt, throwing women into pools of water to see if they were a witch. In fact, from now on, when women come to the waters of baptism, add one step, see if they float. It'll save us all a lot of time and heartache. (laughs) And that went all over the Wasatch Front. Like, it got picked up all over. So that's probably part of why they don't want me back, too, but... Um, but when Janice got, I mean, I was, that was really shocking to me because I went to, I went to both of her courts or something. Okay. Um, and it, she had two. I, she had two. And it was just like, what are you, it was like a purge. This is Janice. Yeah. What are you doing? So. Well, uh, I wonder if that's the difference. Janice was still going to church, whereas you just. I had barely stopped. Okay. I had, I had just I had just not I like so in May I stopped going. Okay. And it because I was just like, this isn't. <laughs> this isn't so because going. you basically stepped away from the church and quit going, that made you not a target. But because Janice was still going, what well, made me? A tar- I was still a target. I mean, I was targeted. What do you mean? No. Well, it's funny to me that Janice got she got put on probation, which was she says was the same as disfellowshipment. Um, and then a year later, oh right, then they asked me to give. They but didn't do never, anything. They've never done that with you. I, you know, I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why. Um, because in the handbook it says, if someone's disfellowshipped, you need to do something within like a year or two, or something like that. And okay. it's been thirty years. I don't, I don't hear a word from anybody, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> I mean, and I haven't taken my name off the records, partly because I keep forgetting. Um, and I, I might sometime. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not weird, right? That well, yeah, and even Margaret, because she didn't get excommunicated until 2000. Yeah, so that's why the September 8 makes sense, except for this was years later. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, both Janice and Margaret were in trouble, and I think Paul kind of, Paul. well, Margaret said, <laughs> Paul waved the red flag in front of the bull. Yeah, well, it's Paul. <laughs> and they went after Paul. <laughs> it is Paul. Of Margaret. Yeah, it's of Margaret. But, you know... It, I mean, Margaret is the same thing. She is so lovely and so wonderful. And the fact that they would, you know, it just is like, it's just small-minded and mean. mean. It's what, it's what uh, Paul says, you know, that Margaret's, Margaret's court was like being raped by the Care Bears. Yeah, yeah. he said that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was, they, we, they, she's it's just, yeah, painful. Because these are believing Mormons. And to go after them because of who knows why, yeah. petty. And well, and I, I think Margaret was still speaking in public, yeah. and you've just kind of like disappeared off the radar, and yeah. Mormonism's yeah. in your past, and you don't care about it anymore. And so there's no reason to go after you. Maybe, that, maybe. I mean, I just, I just went. Like I said, when they asked me to do something else, go find something else to do, I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it's been really good. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so what what do you think of these anniversaries that we keep having? Oh, it's been 30 years. There's a new book coming. Actually, yeah. I think it just came out this month. Oh, did it? I should read it. Um, you know, first of all, it was a really interesting experience for me to come and, like, write a paper to give at Sunstone because I had it brought up all kinds of stuff that I hadn't thought about for, really, for 30 years. Um, being there with people that I hadn't seen for a long time, it was really kind of lovely, actually. Um I loved, I loved the what it took to write it again because it was, it was something I needed to do. It kind of let me know where I was, you know, in a way okay. that was really good. Got those intellectual juices. Going yeah, again. well, there wasn't. I didn't write a very intellectual. I wrote a really feeling paper because the okay. question was, 
where are you spiritually after 30 years? So I actually talked about where I was spiritually after 30 years. And um, so it was a, it was it was great, but it's all, you know every once in a while there's a there's an article in the paper that they never tell me you know it just shows up and I'll get people saying hey you were in the paper again it's like it just kind of amusing in a way like <laughs> really because it was a long time ago because for you it's just totally in the rear view and yeah. so probably these anniversaries yeah. you're like oh what yeah it's really it was just kind of it was you know, maybe we're aware and plus what I have loved about this time is. It reconnected me with Margaret and Paul in particular because we have been, you know, Margaret's been busy, I've been busy, and I get, I'm, I'm seeing them more often, which makes me so happy. And um, I love seeing Janice, who I adore. I mean, it's just those things have been really worth the let's have this 30-year reunion, and I don't want to lose touch with them again because they're, they're fantastic human beings, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Margaret and Paul have both been on twice and yeah. they're just they're fun people they're great they're really, I mean they're really great and and Mike and Levina I mean Levina came I mean she came with warm bread and jam to my house you know right. and so anyway so it was it was uh it was good it was good doing that after 30 years yeah but I don't think you're going to do it in another 30 years so <laughs> you won't be here in I don't think I'll be here in well, I don't know. Your, your mother's still here my mom is still here she's 93 so we'll see <laughs> yeah well, cool. Well, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else we need to cover? I, I don't. I mean, what? do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it then. So, um, Lynn Whitesides, I really appreciate you for being here on Gospel Tangents, and thanks for, thanks for being on the show. No, well, thank you. It's been really fun. It's been really fun. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lynn Whitesides. Lynn, thank you so much for sitting down with me. It was awesome to talk to you and learn more about your story. In our next conversation, we're going to turn to Michael Quinn, who has passed away, so I thought I'd rerun his interview. I don't agree with all the policies of the church, and some of them I strongly disagree with. And to that extent, although I did not seek excommunication, excommunication freed me from having to defend policies I thoroughly disagree with. And that continues to till today. So I maintain my faith in a private way. I'm in some ways like a Latter-day Saint medieval mystic. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospel tangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.